Hi, I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to my podcast number 471, Stage 6, Expanding Play Routines in Stages of Play for Toddlers and Preschoolers with Language Delays, brought to you by my website, Teach Me to Talk, where we're the largest provider of ASHA-approved CEUs for early intervention. Thank you so much for joining me today, and if it's your first time, welcome, (laughs) and let me explain what you're watching or listening to. Each of my podcasts is actually a continuing education course for therapists, and each one is about an hour long. Today's show is a little bit longer. It's going to be about an hour and a half. And it, we are so excited to have parents join us for these courses too. So even if you can't watch in one sitting, because admittedly that's a long time, <laughs> just watch in chunks and get the information so that you can make yourself the most effective parent you can be of a child with language delays. If you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, we would so appreciate your support. All right, for therapist, I'm including the link below here. Um, Uh, the post on YouTube so that you can get your CE credit at my website at Teach Me to Talk. The show number is 471 and the $5 CEUs includes your handout for today's show or the show notes plus your CE credit. Now there's also an option for parents just to purchase uh, the handout for today's course and I know you're going to want to get that information so that you can keep it and put it into practice. All right, let's get going. Today we're looking at stage six, expanding play routines. And again, this is my Stages of Play podcast series for toddlers and preschoolers with language delays. Now, all the information is on the handout, so if you purchase that already, please follow along. Now, we're all the way up to the sixth stage of play. And remember, this is based on Dr. Carol Westby's work uh, with her symbolic play scale. Now, we're all the way up to the 24 to 30 month developmental level. And again, we're talking about chronological age. And here we're specifically talking about the milestones that are consistent with typical development. Now our older babies, <laughs> older toddlers now that we're talking about and preschoolers with language delays may still be in this stage of play. So it's super important for us as therapists and professionals who work with children with language delays that we really, really take this information and figure out how we can use it to best help our little friends with language delays. So what's going on in this stage of play? Well, there are two big developments that I want to talk about before we run through the whole thing. First of all, pretending is established. This is where we see real pretending really, really uh, start to be obvious, like it maybe even to parents or somebody that doesn't analyze play skills like we therapists do, but we've built up to it. Here at stage six, children are using objects to begin to represent something else, and we know that is true pretending, and they become symbolic here between ages two and three. And again, we built up to it. Let's do a quick review. Back in stage three, they learn to use real objects for their intended purpose purpose and that was typically uh, with typical development at 13 to 17 months and so that if they saw a hairbrush they knew that they could brush their hair with it if they saw a toothbrush that's for brushing their teeth if they saw a cup that's for drinking if there's a blanket there they may try to cover up pretend like they're uh, going to sleep or maybe even cover up a baby doll at stage four they begin to be even more symbolic they used lifelike props to pretend actions on themselves and so again just more evidence that they're now not only knowing what that that object is used for but you see that repetitiveness where they do the same thing over and over and you start to think oh my goodness they're playing on purpose here they really they're getting it they're starting to really understand what this play thing is all about at stage five we saw that play advance even more because children begin to combine those actions so maybe before all of their little uh, play routines were real isolated you would in, in there was no real combination but now they're really joining ideas and remember we talked about what an important concept that is for language development because until the child can combine play ideas he's not really developmentally able to combine things symbolically which would mean what words so he doesn't really get to phrases so we talked about that a lot back in stage five and they were not pretending just with objects on themselves they're now able to take that pretend outside of themselves and use other people and remember there they started to do things on you as the adult when you're playing with them or on uh, maybe even a baby doll or a stuffed animal something somebody that's a passive recipient Uh, but here again at stage six we see that maturation because they start to use those objects 
objects, not only those lifelike props, but they also begin to really start to use an object to represent something else. So if they are playing maybe with a set of blocks, they might pretend that block is a car now and pretend they're going to drive it. Or maybe if they're outside playing, they might have a stick and they might pretend to cook and the stick is their spoon. And then in a minute, they start to play with another child. And again, maybe not that, it's not going to be that cooperative play, which we're about to talk about in a second. But again, they, they're in some kind of battle. And so that, then that stick that which was the spoon now becomes their weapon and they're fighting with it. Again, as that pretending really, really emerges. So that's, or is established. So that's number one. The second big development is that other children are now included. And again, remember we're talking about from 24 to 30 months. And so for us as therapists, we need to keep that in mind when we're working with children who are uh, developmentally delayed. And so we can't really expect them to share or include a lot of other children in their play until developmentally they're at that 24 to 30 month level and again what lets us know that they're there we're looking at their play skills and their language skills and so here again we're going to be hearing phrases and so until we hear a child really using a lot of phrases we think gosh you know, developmentally, he may just not be there yet to include other kids, or he just may not be there yet to really, really be able to talk to other children. And so we don't work on that as hard <laughs> or as purposefully as we do when we know, yes, this child is here at this developmental stage. And so here, let's talk about that social development here. So children uh, are spectators or onlookers a lot of times with other children here, especially at the beginning of the stage. And so they may not be joining in play with other children Yet, but they're watching and they're very very interested and this is the first step if you're working with a child say with autism or with markers for autism getting them to watch other children and really focus on them that's when you know gosh he's getting ready he's getting ready to really include other children and we see that his social skill development is really really moving along now the other big way that we describe play here with other children in this stage is parallel play and so children are playing beside or near other their kids but not yet truly playing cooperatively or associatively yet and they may here at this stage or they will start to talk to other children this is the stage where kids begin to learn other children's names and say if they go to a daycare or a little preschool program they start to come home and talk about their friends because this is where they've really started to learn other other uh, kids what they're called and start to call out to them and and again these are just the very beginnings of social play with other children they may laugh or tussle over trying to share toys and they're excited about playing together but there's no real joint cooperation yet which we really characterize as planning and really talking about play and we won't get to that uh, until another stage or two all right let's talk about the main developments in language at this stage well let's start with receptive language because if you followed my work for a while, you know that I think that we do not emphasize receptive language enough, even as early interventionists who do this stuff all day long. But let's talk about receptive language. Here at 24 to 30 months, we see a child's ability to follow follow longer directions. So this would be two-step commands, and this fits ever so perfectly <laughs> with what we talked about back in stage five, that children are really able to combine ideas. And now here at stage six, they're expanding those play ideas and those things that they think about and those mental representations. They're doing that even more now. So naturally, they're going to also be able to listen and hold more information in their little minds and then carry that out and we first see that in two-step related commands something that naturally comes like take your cup and go put it in the sink or go get your shoes and bring them to me so that I can put your shoes on two things that go together and then they start to do two things that are completely unrelated so those two-step commands because of that because of that receptive language jump and because of this cognitive cognitive jump that's allowed all of this to take place, their language begins to expand more too. And so we'll see a, another, we, we talked about the language explosion that generally happens right before two, and we talked about this a lot back in the Language Milestones podcast series. But here we see it again in just, uh, just great increases in vocabulary, and especially with variety. So if children have had lots of nouns, and all new talkers begin with nouns, but now they also begin to include lots of other kinds of 
uh, grammatical uh, categories. And so lots of different verbs are added here at this phase. So between 24 and 30 months, they start to speak in short phrases again with emerging grammar. And we're going to review those specifics when we get to the real uh, meat of the course. But here we're just talking about kind of the introduction there. Another big thing that happens here in language development at this stage is that children begin to narrate experiences and comment on their own actions and the actions of others. And so again, now they are really, really talking. And I know I've said that in, I guess the last couple of shows is the build up. But here when they start to really use sentences and they start to, uh, again, uh, we see that maturity with that the big jump in not only uh, vocabulary with the number of words that they're using, but their their phrases and start to get longer. And here at the beginning, let's just talk about this. At the beginning of the stage, you might hear something like uh, when a kid is 24 to 27 months, you know, Henry gets cookie. But by the end of this stage, by 30 months or two and a half, it becomes, I'm getting more cookies, mommy. And so again, a big, big jump here in language. Now, like we've pointed out in the previous stages, and like I said in our introduction, Older toddlers and even preschoolers with language delays will be in this stage too. And so it doesn't matter how old the child is. If this is where his skills are, or this is what you're building to, this is the stage of play that he's in no matter what his age is. And so these ideas are going to be appropriate for you. Even if your own child or a child you're working with is four or five or older, if they are new to doing phrases and new to combining play ideas, this is what you should be working on. This is that next little run up. So for stage six, like we've done in every show in this podcast series, let's really break it down and do our systematic review. And so you'll need your handout for this. So now let's begin by looking at play skills that we see develop in stage six. So play skills for stage six. And remember, this is based on Dr. Carol Westby's work. So our themes here, what's the big theme that children use when they're playing between 24 and 30 months? They are still really focused on their daily experiences with realistic uh, and life-size objects. And by that, I mean that it's a regular size brush or a regular size cup. In the next stages, you'll see where their play, again, keeps on maturing and the complexity increases. We can get down to where kids are really playing with miniature sets. And they almost like that better than even the life-size stuff. And so think about do a dollhouse set with food versus the bigger kinds of plastic foods that we're going to talk about when we do the toy review. So that's what I mean by that. Children also here at stage six begin to take on roles consistent with the activity. So if they are playing baby dolls, a child, instead of just doing the things with the baby, now you can see uh, he or she are becoming the mommy or the daddy or even the baby. And another thing here as far as themes go and kind of their where, where they are cognitively with play, they use the toys that you would expect for them to use in the midst of that play routine. And they've also gotten really, really good at using a big variety of toys again for their intended purpose. And so we said kids were really kind of focused on that between 13 and 17 months. Now here at over two, they really play with most toys appropriately. And even if they see a new toy that they have very limited uh, previous exposure to, they can kind of figure it out based on all of their previous information. So that nice jump in cognitive skills you can really observe after two. Let's talk about organization with play. Play is much more organized here now that a child has turned two. So back in stage five, children began to combine two related toys together. And remember we said that they demonstrated those short, isolated bursts of play. But now the combinations, and, and then in stage five, that's when they started to really combine. So a child might rock a doll and then put it to bed, or like we said, when they would maybe take a baby doll, set it down, and then get a bowl and a spoon and feed it from the spoon. But here at stage six, over two, play becomes even more detailed and again it takes a really big jump in complexity. So now a child elaborates on a single daily experience. So in stage five you might have seen two actions. Here at stage six there are multiple actions within the same thing. So for example let's say kitchen. Let's say that a child is going to play with a little kitchen set. 
or some the little toys that uh, you've gotten that you put together that uh, are like kitchen play. And I'm going to show you some great ones when we get to the toy review. But now he's not only doing a couple things together, he's doing a lot of things. So he might put uh, something in a pan and then put it on the stove and then maybe get a spatula and try to flip the food. And then he's going to take the food off and put it in a plate and then try to feed you with it. And so what was that? Maybe four or five steps there. So that's the kind of thing we see. Let's say that uh, he's going to play baby dolls. And so uh, he might get a baby doll out and he might start by uh, you know uh, picking the baby doll up and wrapping it up and then he might see the stroller and he decides to go put the baby doll in the stroller and then he walks over pretending that he's going somewhere and then he takes the baby doll out maybe gives the baby doll a kiss and puts it back in the stroller and so again you'll see just some elaborations on those play themes and if you if you're thinking I don't know if I see that with a child just stop and watch watch the kinds of things that they're doing so that you can get uh, a really good idea of where they are if they're still back at stage five that's going to be just the two actions and now here at stage six we see those longer play themes another thing that they do is children choose toys selectively and they group toys together to play and one example that i've given forever uh, in live conferences uh, or all, all the youtube videos here is this is my my prime example of this is how uh, children really mature cognitively after two you can be playing with them with something and then all of a sudden you see them kind of pause and then they stop and then they start to look around for something else or maybe if you're seeing them at home they run to the bedroom and then they come back with something that is perfect for what you two are playing together so they start to be able to again group those toys or find missing pieces and then generate those ideas and their their memories are better so they can remember oh last time I played this we did this and this was so fun I'm gonna run and get this or they're playing and they suddenly realize I don't I don't have this I'm missing something and so they start to go to find it and again that's a new development here at stage six another big development is that during play children show awareness that certain people do certain things and that people are different and they start to pretend using different roles so for example I gave you the baby doll example before that a child wouldn't pretend that uh, he or she or the mommy or the daddy or the baby and so again if they're the mommy during play and they're rocking the baby doll and kissing the baby doll but 10 minutes later they're playing a uh, firefighter and you see them start to pretend that they're spraying the water on the burning object but the child there is not going to try to rock a baby doll when she's playing firefighter she only does that when she's pretending she's the mommy with the baby and so there is you start to see some role differentiation there and so that's super super important now as we mentioned in the highlights of the big developmental uh, review that we did at the beginning with the social aspects of play other kids are a part of that play now so they watch other kids they start to really again be interested and again if you're working with a child who has no interest in other children don't sit down with them and get them to try to play together right away don't do that get the, let them hang back let them watch and again in my experience i found that if i can get a kid to watch a gross motor activity so if we are outside on the playground and other children are running you can say look 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 at them or you start to see them sort of start to get interested in that and that's where you really facilitate that by talking about it by uh, making that more important you know you stop doing what it, whatever else you've been doing so that you can help redirect their attention to the other children and so that's uh, you can even do that like if you are working with a group of children inside just to start uh, just a group running game and again you may have some little ones and again I'm talking about our little friends who will probably go on to be diagnosed with autism they're always kind of on the periphery and so while they're doing that a lot of times they're so self isolated and they are just doing what they want to do but when you start to see them really direct their attention to other children that's when you know this is when I can start to really really uh, help them and and be sure to not jump ahead and don't think about it. I'm going to help them by having them come over and sit down and try to play trains or something with that other child you want them just to watch at the beginning and that's a really really important step that you do not need to skip also during this phase parallel play really does begin to uh, be established and uh, remember parallel play is not cooperative play or associative play parallel play means they're just doing they're beside another kid and they may be doing the same thing but they're not really doing anything besides looking at each other and laughing and maybe you know saying a word or two but they're not really planning and again like we said that's going to come in when uh, children are a little bit older in the next stage so 
uh, by, they begin to share toys, as we said before, by two and a half, so by 30 months. And so again, if a kid is not there yet developmentally, don't waste your time <laughs> working on that. Wait, wait until they are ready and it's going to be a lot easier. All right, so that's a summary of play skills. Now let's move on and do our language skills review. Language skills for stage six. So here at stage six, like I've said, kids talk more and they're using more and more and more phrases. So you'll still hear some single words, but phrases start to really, really dominate their vocabularies. Kids are using three word phrases frequently by 27 months. So that, you know, in, in between, right in the smack in the middle of this developmental phase. Now, like we said in the big development section, early grammar is emerging. So let's talk about what that is and look at these specific milestones here. Now this is huge because what happens? It helps kids move from sounding like babies <laughs> now to sounding more adult-like because you'll start to again hear longer and longer utterances plus these these forms of words start to come in. So let's talk about specifically what these more sophisticated word forms are. First of all we start to hear some ing verbs so some verb tenses so this would be like eat becomes eating sleep becomes sleeping, drink becomes drinking, running, washing, climbing, throwing, reading. Kids will start to really include that little ing. Another thing that happens is they start to include plurals. So this would be cat versus cats or block versus blocks. And so again, you start to hear them really, really mark that final and you start to know that cognitively they possess the ability to look at uh, plurality here. Is there more than one? And they start to really, really mark that uh, that plural noun there. If they start to change that form there, so that you see that their grammar is emerging. Another uh, milestone here is kids start to use possessives, and so not only they use the plural s first, and then they start to use the possessive s. And this is toward the end of this, uh, t closer to 30 months. And so mommy's hair, daddy's truck. Because of that possessive concept, they also begin to use what? Pronouns. And so they use words to substitute. So uh, when they're talking about themselves, they say me, my, and mine. And the next three pronouns to emerge are usually, according to research, I, you, and it. And so those are the pronouns that emerge between two and two and a half. Also, kids use a variety of action words or verbs, and we talked about that in the introduction. Now, they not only have a lot of different nouns, they also have a lot of different verbs. And sometimes this is where the rubber meets the road with us in speech therapy. We've gotten a kid there, he and his parents, boy, they are on learning names of things. But then it gets harder with verbs because they are a little bit more abstract than teaching a noun, which is concrete, that a kid can see, it never changes. And then with a verb, you know, sometimes, again, that's a little harder for our little friends with language delays. Even negation emerges here in this uh, developmental phase. And so what do I mean by de negation? It's where the, a child adds no plus another word. So like no night-night, uh, <laughs> no cookie, no bath, no bed. Again, that you start to really understand that they get that they can add a word and change and make what they're talking about opposite or saying, I am rejecting that, I don't want to do it. All right, with receptive language, we've already talked about that nice jump so that a child can follow two-step commands. So let's look at some other comprehension skills. And my source on this is the Rossetti Infant Toddler Language Scale. Children can point to four different action words and pictures. So not only when you're reading a book, you can say, where's the cat? Where's the house? Show me the car. Now you can say, show me who's sleeping or who's crying, or which boy is running, and they can identify that. And again, we said that they're using more verbs, and before they use more verbs, they have to understand more verbs. And so now that they not only understand more verbs, we can see that they can uh, look at it uh, representatively, so that they can pick it out in a picture. So a nice, nice bump in their comprehension skills. And so that's something that you can assign to parents to do. That's a really kind of homework thing that when, before we start to work on ING verbs, to really talk with a parent about when they're reading books together that they use a lot of ING verbs and that they start to really ask children, you know, not only where the noun is when they're looking at a picture, you know, where's the tree, where's the sun, show me the flower. They're also helping children identify those verbs. So that's a great thing for parents to work on at home too. Another thing they can do here with comprehension is different 
differentiate size words. So they can tell you which car is big and which car is little or whatever word you've taught there, big and small, you know, what, whatever you've just, whatever label you've decided to put on that, they can really differentiate those size words. And kids like that a lot. Here's where they start to really pretend that things are, you know, if you're playing with a farm set, you know, the mommy pig and the baby pig or the daddy pig and, you know, again, the baby pig or the mommy and the daddy and the baby. So that's where we see a lot of this so come in too. Uh, they also understand location phrases or prepositions. And so for uh, lots of time now, they, you've been working on your prepositions, but now you can put it in a phrase. So not only when you're playing with a child, is he going to follow a command like put it in, but now you can say things, you know, put it in the barn. And, you know, if you've got your play barn out or put it in the stall or put it in the water. And so again, they can get that differentiation by understanding that phrase. Uh, with that preposition too. By the end of this period, children also can identify objects by function. And so things like, which one do you wear on your head? Which one goes on your feet? If you're looking at an animal puzzle, you might say, you know, which one is flying or which one is swimming? And so they can really understand that too. Again, we talked about that with the action words, uh, but again, uh, with that function, you, you, they can, they can uh, identify again what those uh, the, the tools, what, 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 it, what something is for, they can do that. And that's a big jump in cognition and comprehension. Also at this stage, they begin to respond to simple questions accurately. So you can ask them what's that and their labeling is really good uh, when they're at that 24 to 30 month developmental level. And they can also start to answer some uh, pretty simple yes and no questions pretty accurately. All right, because we're talking about language so heavily today in this stage, and I'm talking about very specific goals like ing verbs, plurals, and possessives, I'm going to give you lots of ideas, particularly when we're doing the toy review you, but I also want to give you two great resources from Teach Me to Talk if you need help teaching these kinds of words. I did a whole Language Milestones podcast series. I think there were 14 different shows in that series, but this series uh, began at course number 450 with 12-month skills, and so uh, the 24 to 30-month skills are shows number 456 and 457. 456 is the receptive language show, and then 457 is the expressive language show, but we talk about all the strategies to help teach ing verbs, plurals, possessive pronouns, uh, uh, variety of verbs, all the things that we're talking about today. If you need more help than the things you're going to get a little bit later in the show when we do the toy review, please go back and look at those uh, courses. I'll put those links here below. And again, if you're just listening on your podcast app, shows 456 and 457. Check those out. Let's look at our activities and strategies here for stage six. So in stage six, what's our primary purpose? Remember what it was, what this whole stage is called? It's expanding play routines. And by that we mean that we want children to sequence different actions during play and include more steps. And so if you've been with me through this whole series, do you remember what I say is our, just our top evidence-based strategy for um, what we're gonna use? What's our main strategy for teaching play? It's always what? adult modeling. And what does that mean? That means you are going to show them how to play with a toy. And so that's still super important here at stage six at 24 to 30 months because learning more steps, sometimes our, our little guys kind of get stuck between they want to play. You can see that they want to play, but they just don't know what to do next. And so our, our, our goal here is to help facilitate that play and keep it going again by adding more steps. Now I usually call that when I'm playing with a child, the next thing. What are we going to do next? What's our next thing? And that might be a little phrase that you start to adapt when you're playing that kind of gives them a cue like, okay, let's move on and let's do something else here. We also want to be sure here that a child is learning to become symbolic. Now this will happen gradually as everything else has thus far in our review of play skills and it certainly will continue to happen as a child moves on to uh, turning three and turning four and turning five. But here at stage six, right after a child is two, two to two and a half, uh, they do start to, again, as we said, begin to use one object to become another object. And I already gave you that example with the block and with the stick. And again, a child may take that same block and pretend, you know, you're playing, uh, let's say that you are at the end of the stage and you're starting to, again, do something more with roles and um, not quite to dress up because that really is closer to a 36 month skill, but let's say that you're, you're playing with uh, kind of makeup, that kind of thing, a little girly thing where they're 
pretended to blow dry their hair or pretended to put on makeup and let's say then that, that you don't have a hairbrush and they realize they don't have a hairbrush and so a child really at that stage might grab that same block and pretend that it's a hairbrush and again we want to facilitate that so what do you do you don't overwhelm a child first of all you can't go in and kind of pull back all the lifelike props and just put stuff in and start pretending that a block is every single thing that you need but occasionally start to do that particularly when a child doesn't have a toy there or an object to do what you can tell that he wants to do so that's a great way to kind of get this going here in stage six now let's talk about what our best language strategies are for this period so expansion and extension and extension are what we're going to use to get to longer phrases so what was expansion and we talked we've talked about this for several shows now as a child was uh, learning how to combine words into phrases and so just like we did to get from one word to two words we're going to do the same thing to get from two words to three words to three words to four words and that means that we're just going to expand what he says so that if a child says that block you might say uh, I'm getting that block or I need that block or something again to expand that from that two word phrase make it a little longer with that, those three and four word phrases but let me caution you don't cue everything or make everything so imitated once we get to this phase now I know some of you are thinking Laura you talk about imitation all the time that's kind of one of the things you're known for is that building verbal imitation chart where you know everything is imitated yes <laughs> But here we were talking about like talkers who've gotten a little bit beyond that and so I think about it at this point once they really get to using say three and four word uh, phrases and utterances all the time I don't want to use a lot of imitation unless it's the only way I can get the new new phrase so that means or let's let's not say imitation let's say lots and lots of over cueing for imitation because we're certainly going to model hoping that the child imitates and that's always our primary thing is just modeling what we want a child to say but I see a lot of times parents and even sometimes therapists make the mistake of really really over cueing even at this point so that you're saying say to mommy uh, I want that yogurt or say to mommy you know again it's kind of a canned phrase and that's fine if that's the only way we can get it but try really hard to make it a little bit more natural just with lots of modeling uh, and again making it more conversational and waiting on a child to imitate without all of those direct cues and let me say it one more time we only want to use direct imitation or direct cueing for imitation only when we don't hear a child begin to imitate on his own now, I talk a lot about this in the late talker workbook if you haven't taken a look at that yet do and most of this uh, uh, the conversation that we have about that and the discussion is in plan a there are actually three different plans in that uh, therapy manual so if you haven't taken a look at that yet please do uh, the link is going to be below here now let's move on and talk about toys so what kinds of toys do we use for this stage so what did we say we were doing here at stage six we said our main focus is what it's expanding play routines and so we're going to take even those earlier combinations and add other stuff so we have to have what we have to have sets <laughs> we have to have more things and more options for a child so that we can create more actions and then more opportunities even for our language teaching so there are countless options for this kind of play little people Fisher Price Disney Barbie any kind of theme that you can kind of think about all those children's shows and all those children's <laughs> networks <laughs> have produced tons of toys that are really really appropriate uh, for this stage and so what I like to think about is using some something that a child likes and he already knows to really keep him interested and again provide that motivation for a child to move on to that more complex play and let me just say even though I've mentioned television shows here I am still not a big fan of screen time <laughs> I think that children uh, really really especially our children who want screens the most probably need them the least and lots of times when I'm working with a family and they say to me oh we've just completely cut TV out he was so focused on TV he would get or, or we just don't let him have the iPad anymore because all he did was pitch a fit when it, it was just terrible when we tried to remove it and so we really pulled a plug on that and so if that sounds like something that would be uh, useful for a child or you want to explore more about that I've written a lot about that at Teach Me to Talk so take a look at that if you're working with a child who is really really struggling to play having less screen time may be the way to go for him uh, I could probably talk about this all day that's a show for another day but I did kind of want to interject it there because I don't want you to think that I'm saying hey 
use screen time to help him play or I hope a child is watching shows because if he doesn't have a lot of characters or a lot of pre-knowledge of what to do he's not going to know how to pretend play I'm not saying that at all I'm saying if a child doesn't already use that preference that he has uh, but again I think it's best for children to really really be exposed to technology in limited amounts of time and most of the time with an adult present so that you can help them uh, change all of that isolated viewing activity into a language learning opportunity. All right, beyond those sets that we talked about and beyond kind of themes from TV shows and movies, let's take a look at what research says are the best play themes for toddlers and preschoolers. Now, talk about this back exclusively in podcast 436 if you want an in-depth review. But for toddlers, our very best play themes are kitchen, baby dolls, a house or a playground set, so something like that, a farm, and then my addition to this list is some kind of vehicle play with a garage or a racetrack. Now for preschoolers, and again these are children three to five, we're not going to talk about this in today's show, but I'm going to give you the information. Restaurant, and that could be any kind of food service thing like a pizza shop or ice cream shop or maybe a lemonade stand or hot chocolate or anything like that. Birthday party and other holidays like Christmas or whatever their family celebrates. Um, picking apples or kind of harvest time, that's an extension of that farm play. Pet shop in, or, or a vet or going to the doctor. So those are the big things that we can see for preschoolers. All right, remember what we also said that children are now including lots and lots of their daily events, but now they expand that to kind of that next circle of activities and they're including less familiar activities now. So something like a doctor visit or a birthday party. And again, I said that's for preschoolers. Those are the most popular themes, but of course we could, uh, if a child is interested in that, if that's a topical theme that's going on, between two and two and a half, I would certainly include that too. Um, so begin the play routine. And what I like to do if we feel like a child is kind of stuck with playing and he's not really expanded to those less familiar events, take an event that's just happened in his life so that he's got some experience to draw on. So in January or early February, we might still play Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever that family celebrated. Or again, they went to the doctor last week and had a well baby check. Uh, we would try to play that now because again they've got that idea there and they're going to be able to remember those things and you're going to you're going to even maybe recreate some of those things that happened in the doctor's office if they um you know got a sucker you know you might pretend with that or if they you know got a shot even something that was a little bit negative that they you know had a negative reaction to and again kids like to work out those kinds of things in play routines as well and certainly uh, our colleagues who are psychologists will tell us that's one of the most effective tools that we can use uh, so when we do that when we're introducing those less familiar activities begin that play routine with the phrase you know, something like that's going to teach them and going to really start kind of help them even organize what the play's going to be. And remember what we said at 24 to 30 months that children are grouping toys and they're understanding what toys go together and they're realizing when they don't have something that they need to play. And so this is an important part and this is where executive functioning starts right here at two years old and so really really help our little friends with that and so let's say that we're going to use something and again a less familiar activity let's say that the family just went to uh, the zoo last week and so you want to use that opportunity to help expand these play routines and so you say something like I know we're going to pretend that baby's going to the zoo remember last week when you went to the zoo what do we do? What do we need so we can play that? And so again, you're going to get your baby doll and you're maybe going to gather the stroller or the carrier, whatever you're going to use for that. And then you're going to need some animals. So help a child pretend. And that, I, that idea as I'm talking about it is going to be kind of closer to the end of this period as children, you know, 30 months or between two and a half and three. But you get the idea here where they're going to really start to gather their items. If that's too complex, you might do it even with a simpler thing like baby dolls or like farm, you know, oh, what are we going to need to play let's play farm what do we need oh the animals where are our animals oh the barn where's the barn and so again you kind of walk through that so help a child begin to assemble and begin to be a little more organized all right so let's go ahead now and take a look at the recommended toys for stage six and talk about them now before we do i want to remind you of our primary focuses so we all stay together on what our goals are we need sets for teaching children how to include the next step so that they can expand that play. Remember what we said, we want lots of steps and lots of sequences here. 
Next, we want to help a child learn to organize and group toys. And we've already talked about that a lot. So we'll talk about that as we move through these different toys. And lastly, we also want to keep our other kinds of play moving along. And so the last couple of shows, we've talked a little bit about fine motor development. And we'll do that here again. So let's start that now. And let's take a look at our first toy, which is puzzles. All right, let's continue our discussion about wooden puzzles. Now, if you are a pediatric speech language pathologist, I am sure you own lots of these. <laughs> so let's talk about the progression in skills so that we can get kind of kids to this point. And if you're watching for some, and thinking about your kids that, you're, uh, that aren't quite here yet developmentally, you'll have some good ideas. Now, before now, like we talked about back in stage five, children should be doing uh, puzzles with say three or four pieces and maybe the bigger wood knobs. Here, children are able to do um, puzzles with more pieces as you can see but we also have the smaller knobs so let me give you just a couple little tips if you have kids that this is just too small for you can put some play-doh or some silly putty or anything like that on here and make this knob a little bigger I've actually had puzzles I don't have one here but let me grab this puzzle this is a new puzzle. I haven't opened it yet, but it's a Melissa and Doug chunky puzzle. And I think I got this at like Dollar General or somewhere. But when they don't have the pieces, if you can see that a child really needs the knobs, you can buy like cabinet knobs or something from Lowe's or Home Depot or even Amazon and glue those on there and make that easier for a child who would need that. If uh, And again, there's value in doing a puzzle without the knobs too, you know, just that children uh, need to get the, the piece in the correct slot. But again, Again, I like that. That's just a quick tip if you uh, have a child that you're working with that you think, you know, boy, he could really, really use something to hold on to to help him get these pieces in the correct uh, spot. Now, let's talk about our language goals and all the things you can do in therapy with puzzles. Now, as we have discussed at length in this series, every single child, whether they talk on time or talk late, vocabulary development is always a big, big goal, and puzzles really help us do that because we can target lots of different words in one activity that's really holding a child's attention. And again, we can uh, think about it in themes and sort of tell where our holes are with vocabulary development. And so, I I have puzzles to work on everything, <laughs> but you do too. I have some older ones that even I had themes like what we wear. I have a bathroom puzzle. I have some puzzles with food and not just uh, the ones that we kind of see in our plastic sets with some some uh, more uh, complex vocabulary here. And so again, even puzzles that have different motor expectations for children, like this great Melissa and Doug farm puzzle that has doors that open and close and the magnets are on the back of the pieces so gosh they really stay in there don't they <laughs> and so again a great way to motivate children who again might have just some different interest and this this puzzle's great because any piece can go in any slot so a great idea for lots of our little friends who maybe get frustrated with getting uh, pieces all in the right places although that is the point of doing the puzzles is really developing their visual matching skills and again that fine motor development and then we layer language on top of that you can also use puzzles that uh, have tools and remember we talked about how tool use will continue to expand as a child moves through toddlerhood and so something like a fishing puzzle that a child uh, can use a fishing pole with and so lots and lots of fun uh, and lots and lots of uh, skill practice as we're doing puzzles there too. All right, so let's talk about some other things that we can do with puzzles. I like to uh, use puzzles. If a child will sit with me and do puzzle after puzzle, that's great, but a lot of times, uh, I like to use puzzles with kids who need movement during therapy, and it's just it's such an easy thing to set up. You put the, the puzzle board on one side of the room, usually you know opposite of where you want a child to be, and then have them run. Take a piece from you, and usually at the beginning of the activity, and let's just get a puzzle with the pieces back here. You may hold the pieces in a bag, and if you've seen my work, you know I'm a big fan of two and a half gallon Ziploc bags because nearly every toy will fit in there. And so you hold the pieces, 
and you know you have a child request the pieces and you could even do it maybe even receptively if a child is not there yet and isn't naming pieces and can't ask you for a piece yet you can even do some receptive things with this you know where's the boat or find the helicopter and so again a child can can work on receptive language with puzzles too if he's not quite in the point i uh at the point of working on expressive language and really really naming i like using receptive language with puzzles at the end of the activity for cleanup and so that you are saying to a child you've already named everything you've already talked about it he's ready to move on before you do have him clean up the puzzle and have him uh identify the pieces that way and so you can say oh i'm going to tell you what to clean up let's get the zebra okay great now find the lion let's clean up the lion oh now's the step of the snake and so a different thing that you can do here for children who are working on two step commands sometimes our little friends can't always hold that information in their little working memory and so that's why they can't follow two step directions and so we help them get there by adding another step and so you can do this with puzzles and so you the the in-between step there that we need to add and so you ask them to find two different things so here with the puzzle you might say as you're cleaning up give me the zebra and the elephant or if you're holding out the bag or the basket or whatever container you're using to organize your play and have them clean up and you're gonna say oh we're gonna find two find the bird and the snake and so again I promise that idea works so well to help children move from holding one little piece or one little part of that command to helping them be able to move on to a two-step related command or just a two-step even unrelated command there uh, so great thing another thing that we can do with puzzles here at this stage is work on object functions and remember we said by the end of this stage that children would be able to do that and so you can work on those uh, with the puzzle and you might say something like um, uh, and, and you might even have multiple answers here you know which one says woo 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 or which one flies or which one goes in the water and again you could do it with a closed puzzle you know which one goes on your head what do you wear on your feet what do you wear when it's cold outside and so help children begin to do some of those object function things and puzzles are a great great way to do that let me show you another toy that I think about for fine motor development and then another interest, and that would be magnets. The kids really start to love uh, to play with toys with magnets because it's so cool to them to kind of learn about that and that this is stuck on and can I get can I get the magnet to stick on this toy and why won't it stick on that toy? So it's a great kind of problem solving toy for kids too. But I like it for fine motor development. And I've got this great little uh, magnet set. I think this is, is Melissa and Doug, but you'll have to see below. I'll include the right uh, product in the link below. But look for a, to a toy with magnets because that's a great one. I have a little woodpecker toy. And again, I'll try to link that. I don't have it here with me today. But great, great way to help kids begin to work on that next little level of, of fine motor skills. But we're also helping them learn about a, a new concept there too. So great, great with problem solving. Now here language wise let's talk about some of the language things that you can work on and remember we said here that we're working on pronoun development we're working on ing verbs and even plurals and we can work on all of those just with this uh, little toy set and so you might you know as you're playing model you know at the beginning of this stage you might still be modeling a lot of two word phrases so i hook or three word phrases i hook car but then by the end and you know the middle and the end you need to model something a little bit more uh, in keeping with our milestones here so i'm hooking the car or even if they're leaving off that uh, contracted copula i hope i'm saying that correctly or remembering that correctly using those uh, different little verb contraction or contractions there with uh, the subject plus the verb with I'm uh, model that for them and, and see what you can do again with working on that verb with or that structure with just some exposure there and so even you know again those two word phrases at the beginning I hook hook car you know take off pull off those kinds of things and then by the end you know again you're saying uh, the things that are a little bit more complex you know I'm hooking the car I'm taking the car off I'm pulling the car off I'm pushing the truck and and work on your specific little language goals within the context of that play activity now therapists are used to that 
we're used to kind of taking whatever our goal is and matching it with whatever the activity happens to be but sometimes parents need a little bit more help with that and for you to really really spell out what exactly they're supposed to be working on and so be sure that you're doing that with a lot of modeling but with lots and lots of specific directions this handout for the show has some great uh, little scripts and all the examples that I've been giving are listed on the handout so that might be another reason for you to want to get the handout so that you can share that uh, with parents of children that you're seeing or also as a parent with your child's team so that you can talk about what you're working on with language at home and make sure that's on the same page as your speech language pathologist or even your other therapist on your team so great toy to do that with check those magnet toys out Let's start with this toy microwave. Now I have used this toy for a long, long time and it's one of my absolute favorites. It is popular with little friends from the time they're toddlers all the way through preschool. So this is a good investment for you to make. You'll get a lot of bang for your buck. So what are we working on here at stage six? We are helping children expand play. So we want them doing lots of steps. So with the toy microwave, you are naturally going to need something for them to cook. And so I like the little plastic foods for this and I love when a kid gets over two to use the cuttable foods now under two a child may be able to do this with some help with you doing some hand over hand with cutting the foods but after two they should certainly be able to do it on their own and so you've added another step here and you are talking about the food you know you may even have them request what they want to cook if you're keeping all of the foods you know in the ziploc bags that i show you all the time or a basket or something you know you might uh, be the keeper of the food and so the child has to ask you for what they want next if they are at that requesting level and again if they're not saying sentences have them do it in a phrase or you know longer phrases like we've been talking about toward this uh, this or in this developmental period toward the end have them do it in a phrase if the kid that you're working with his play skills are here but his language skills aren't he can certainly request using a single word if you have our little friends who are nonverbal they can request with a sign or with a gesture like pointing and so again you can use this toy for children who are in this developmental stage play wise but not necessarily language wise so i hope that i'm giving you some ideas for kind of all of these even if uh, all of these kinds of kids even if they're not all at the same level with play and language but remember here what we said our focus here for play is combining more steps so we have them pick the food cut the food and then cook the food now i love this toy and it just malfunctioned when i was trying to do an earlier take so i hope it'll work for me this time but you uh, you can see the microwave really operates so you put the food in you push the button and then it turns it is a ton of fun for toddlers the carrot's too big let's just do half it's a ton of fun for toddlers because they can watch it go you may develop some verbal routines for this i really like uh you know wait 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 or it's turning it's turning or spin 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 or around 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 give them a word and give them again new vocabulary to use throughout this routine and then you might say something like it's ready you know what do we have to do and so again do some gentle withholding so that you are waiting for them to tell you the next step and you're really encouraging that language so you know you can playfully obstruct the door and not let that child open the door until you know you say what do we do next what do you have to do and so you know he tells you open or open the door or whatever language level and then you know we take the food out and then we can keep that sequencing going with him pretending he's going to eat the food himself he can plate it you know you can you can uh he can give you a bite he can feed a doll there but again it's a great toy for helping a child think about what's the next step what do we do next that next thing and really really helping him oh excuse me uh, expand those play routines uh, i like targeting phrases here too which would be a developmentally appropriate for this stage and i like to use anchor phrases now we've talked about this in previous shows you might call them I don't know you might call them different things but i call them anchor phrases and i think about that it's just that i'm going to keep one word the same or the anchor and then i'm going to change the next word and that's kind of what we're going to practice and this is so effective especially for our little guys with motor planning uh, difficulties or even if they're not three yet even if we've not officially diagnosed them with uh, childhood apraxia of speech we know that they're working on that and so it's easier for a child to change that second word or 
the first word as long as we have one part of that phrase staying the same so here you know you can start with if they're just at the two word phrase you know cook banana cook fish cook bread cook chicken if we bumped up to the level that we're really working on 24 to 30 months language wise you know I'm cooking banana I'm cooking orange I'm cooking fish and again we're really listening for that ing or that verb tense we can also you know teach early pronouns here so I'm cooking orange you cook fish and so again we can work on various um, milestones here that we're targeting at this developmental level this toy is great for our gestalt language learner so what's a gestalt language learner it's a kid who learns in chunks and so not only do they start to speak in chunks when they start to talk and sound scripted or a little bit echolalic they also process in chunks and so it's a nice thing for us to remember to talk to parents about is that they're not analytical learners and our little kind of we kind of think about that it's typical where children learn what one word means at a time Time and then they build that complexity well our little friends who are gestalt language learners learn in chunks and so a phrase like it's time to go to school that's all one word to them you know they've heard it like that and that's how they're learning and identifying that whole process and so even little holistic phrases like I got it I did it where'd it go what's that or even something more scripted like to infinity and beyond or something you know again that's definitively from a movie or a book or a previous kind of conversation that they've lifted and they have that little phrase and they like it we need to maximize those learning opportunities for our little friends and use those phrases in therapy especially when they're not as verbal as we would like them to be that's a surefire way to get a gestalt language learner talking is to pick up some of his and again if he's not quite talking yet but really to pick up some of those things and and expand his vocabulary with using some of those same uh, phrase targets that he uses and use some of those uh, same kinds of words so here usually uh, we think about good phrases to get to start language learners talking would be let's plus something else I'm or it's uh and I like time too and I think a lot of parents have had great success with using a phrase like time too throughout the day to signal transitions and so you can even do it again even in a single play thing where you're, you know time to cook time to open time to shut time to cut time to blow time to eat and so again a great way to introduce verbs what we've got that beginning part of the phrase there stays the same so that a child again learns that uh, that additional word and has the safety or security of that phrase to help them get going so great great way to do that too um, again we talked about the other variety of goals that we can work on on with this um, sequencing action so is our big thing uh, oh let me say one more thing you can also have kids who if they're not quite at this developmental level yet and they're again hanging out there at single words use choices to really increase the frequency uh, that they use words within a single play routine and so you might you know again you know which one are we going to cut first the fish or the banana you know and they choose and then oh um, what are you going to do or you, you know who's going to cut you or me you know and then they say me and then they cut the fish okay we've done that now what are we going to do are we going to eat or cook oh okay we're going to cook it what do we have to do do we leave the door shut or do we open and you just keep those choices going throughout that routine and it's a very very nice way to increase the number of words that a child uses even if it's imitated he'll get there <laughs> spontaneously but we have to introduce it that way at first and i know that i said hey here at this developmental level let's hang back and not do so much direct cueing i'm talking about after they've already got to say that consistent three word level kind of over that hump of 27 to 30 months before then with late talkers you really might have to cue it because it might be the only way that you can get the word so remember that if they're still at single words uh, choices are a great great way to get those imitated words going all right let's keep our kitchen theme going and look at another fun toy and here it is a sink with running water <laughs> how about that so this is such a big hit with toddlers and like the microwave this toy will be used for a long long time with children and I really like these smaller sets like the microwave and the sink it lets a parent kind of put together a little kitchen set sort of one piece at a time and if parents you know certainly and even therapists if you have an in-center program and have a great big kitchen set that's great but this is fantastic for home visits or again for parents who don't have the resources or the room to get 
uh, a big kitchen set like that, these little pieces are just great, great options for kids. So um, think about teaching our play and language combinations. So what was our big play goal here? Remember, we want children to sequence their steps and we also want them to what? We want them to group and organize toys. So this is a fantastic toy for teaching that because you can teach separating dishes versus food, you know, uh, you know, early categories like that. You can even separate maybe bowls versus plates. And so really help a kid uh, get in uh, that practice with really grouping and matching things. Remember what we said about more steps. And so here certainly our biggest step is going to be what? Putting the a dish in the sink and then turning the water on and washing those dishes and kids will have so much fun with this and phrases our language goals are naturally built into this activity you know turn water on turn water off I'm I'm washing dishes I dry dishes I uh, you know whatever just tons and tons of ideas for this with working on not only our little picky goals that we're talking about with ing verbs and plurals and um, possessives pronouns all those other goals that we were talking about but you can certainly even work on those combinations and even things again like new words that kids uh, may not be using yet so fantastic toy for teaching all of those goals our next big theme is baby doll play and here we can combine our baby doll set that we talked about a lot back in the previous show we talked about that you can buy these kinds of pre-made sets or you can take a little set I bought this one at Dollar General I think it was seven or eight bucks but then I added some different things to it and certainly that's something that's a real practical way to help a parent see how to pull together little sets for their children to play with to help them learn to expand play routines now like we said about the toy sink uh, this little toy uh, bathtub is a real hit with toddlers and there is such a range of uh, what the tub will do and how hard it is to operate it I've gotten these little sets at anywhere from Dollar General all the way to the fancier ones on Amazon and so again you really get what you pay for but remember uh, it's a great investment for a child because water play is going to be a big hit for a long time now this is a set that I got from Amazon and honestly you can get it going and a kid can get it going but it is going to take some effort but I sort of like that because that builds in an opportunity for a child to ask you for help and so here you can cue things like help me please or I need help or you know let's do water or turn water on or make water go or you know again a lot of possibilities for whatever your target phrase is going to be there but super super toy and again kids are going to stay so motivated with this because they're going to want to see that water pump and so you're going to see them stay with this toy for a long long time another kind of a uh, quick trick for kids when you can't really get them involved is having them really squeeze the washcloth or squeeze the wipe and um, see that water come out. That's another way that if I see a kid kind of I'm losing him um, and I want him to come back to me, that's another little trick that I use with this. Now here we talk about, uh, you, you can use anything from single words. So for our kids who are at this stage of play but have a mismatch with their language skills, and we see that a lot with our kids who are just straight late talking talkers they come in with all their other skills in place they're great players but their language isn't caught up and so when we when we have kids like that we really need to think about I'm going to match their play skills with what the activities are that I'm going to choose but I'm going to keep their language at what their language goal is and again that's kind of self-explanatory but if you're a parent kind of new to the speech therapy stuff and you want your child to speak in sentences and longer phrases of course but they're not doing a lot of single words you're going to need to stay at that single word level for a while and really help them uh, just learn lots and lots of different words and again master that before we have those expectations to move them on to maybe a level that they're not quite ready for yet and so I like to tell parents and I say this all the time on the show but anytime a kid is having difficulty with something it means what it means that it's too hard <laughs> and so you've got to back it up and make that skill a little simpler so if you are cueing phrase after phrase after phrase and getting nowhere or you know say you're trying to get a three or four word phrase back it up to a two word phrase 
I still can't get that, back it up to that single word level and find that level where that child is going to be successful with you. Same thing with play. Here our goal is to sequence steps, but don't get so carried away that you were trying to have him do eight steps. When he's just turned two, you know, it's not going to happen. And so back it up to make it simpler. You know, we want to get two steps and we want to get, get a three-step play routine and then a four-step play routine. And again, one of your cues needs to be, what comes next? What should we do next? So that you're helping him think about that next step. So what are some things that we could do here with this kind of play with with the bathtub and I want to break it down because I, I always get emails after a show that say something like thank you for all the good ideas I'm not very creative and I really need specifics to get me going or something like uh, I need even more ideas can you explain that even more and so let's talk about what we would do here for a, a bath time routine what would be all the little steps well of course we our baby doll should probably start off dressed so we take the clothes off and then we get ready to what what's the next step what would come next we're going to put her in the tub and then what would come next we're going to try to you know get the shower to work you know so turn water on what else could we do in the bathtub well we could wash different body parts and you don't just say wash baby we're going to break it down you know wash toes wash foot wash knee wash face wash elbow wash belly and so again a great way to kind of get those phrases going and whatever that next step is and again don't make it too complicated especially with the child who was at the beginning of this stage or developmentally you know at the beginning of this stage and that would be you know, just really getting consistent uh, two word combinations and then just two steps in play. And again, that would be a kid who's at the end of stage five, getting ready to go into stage six. My point here is don't overwhelm them with too many things at once. You know, just work on this gradually, adding kind of that next step. And let me say that two-year-olds, especially in the beginning, are super repetitive. So they may do the same three steps over and over and over again, and that's okay. Because we want them to develop that experience and, again, make it fun for them and motivating so they're going to want to keep going. But lots of times kids need that repetition so that they can really learn it and really own those skills. So don't freak out too much. Now, if they're doing the same one step over and over and over you know that's self-stimulatory play we don't want that but again don't get too freaked out if all the kid wants to do is put the baby doll in the water and then push and push and push and push to get uh, more water to come out of the shower and then maybe wash a little bit and then get the baby out and do it all over again that's completely normal and that's exactly what we want to see here at stage six our third theme for toddlers is a house or a playground set. Now, I nearly always start with a playground set because there are less pieces to manage and I can usually get a little bit more of what I want versus in a house play. And here at uh, this stage of play, remember what we said we're working on? Tons of ing verbs. Uh, plurals, pronouns, and possessives. So great, great way to kind of get all these things, especially the verbs. And so when I'm looking for a toy, I just look for variety for, you know, what kinds of things. You know, here we have a, uh, a swing. We have a slide. We have, you know, a way to climb up. You know, uh, we have a tunnel. We have a little up and down with the seesaw here. So naturally you know we're starting out with lots and lots of things to do or especially steps that we're trying to work on here at stage six now i bet like you do i bet you combine your sets right and so here you know i'm going to use whatever characters a child is interested in so a newer theme you know might be bluey and bingo or you might have you know a kid who's really into disney characters and you have your little buzz light year and mickey or um Woody or even Pooh. A kid might like Sesame Street with Cookie Monster and Elmo. You might have kids who are, you know, who don't watch TV, which is fabulous. And so there you just use little generic characters. Even animals work here great with the playground set. So tons of variety here. And remember, we said we're just going to. Uh, keep looking for uh, helping a child learn how to expand actions and so you can take one character and do lots of different things so you can have bluey slide you can have a bluey swing you can have bluey climb there's a little climber rope on the back you can have uh, bluey and bingo ride uh, uh, the seesaw and again you can do it that way, or you can have lots of characters repeat. So you can make a line to the slide, you know, Buzz Lightyear slides, Cookie Monster slides, Poo slides. And so again, think about kind of varying uh, uh, 
your sequencing or varying your actions. And some kids will take one character and do several different things with it, which would be several steps. Or a kid can take... Uh, have one action and have several different characters do that same action. You've accomplished the same goal with sequencing, but a playground set is a fabulous, fabulous toy for you to use to accomplish all of those goals. And again, there's some more ideas on your handout, so check that out. Now here's another idea for farm play, which again is one of those big toddler things that we talk about. And the possibilities really are endless with this uh, kind of farm set. So get yourself a barn, <laughs> get yourself some people, some characters to do some things, and get yourself some animals, and then get some other little things if you can find them. And again, you can see that I've combined all kinds of sets. This is a Melissa and Doug barn set that I just love. It's very durable. It has a carry case, and anything that a child can pick up and carry across the room is naturally going to be something he's going to want to do again and again and again. And don't freak out about that. Just get up and move to where he is when he's taking the barn to a different place. But again, you can do so many things with this. And so let's talk about our play goals and then our language goals. So what did we say we were going to do for play? We said we are expanding play routines, which means what? We're going to combine actions so you can do all kinds of things with this you can put the animals in you can take the animals out you can make them climb up on the barn and let's just talk about some of the th how you would say some of this because i don't know that i've done a ton of this modeling lately uh, in shows but let's just talk about the things that you would say and how you would get this going and so again you know you might say something like you know oh look here's my cow what can my cow do what can he do today? Oh my goodness, here he comes. Walk, 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 walk. My cow's walking. Cow's walking. Oh, what's next? What's next? Where will he go? Oh, cow goes in. Cow's walking in. Oh, look at that cow. What's he going to do? Oh, I think he's sleepy. Shh. I think he wants to go to sleep. And I'm a little awkward doing this, but you get my point. And you're going to make him lay down and go to sleep. And so you just help lead a child through all those things. And will it be as fast as that? No. You're going to slow it way down because the child's going to be doing things that you'll talk about while you are uh, saying what you're going to say with play. And you're naturally going to talk about what he's doing, what you're doing. But my point is here, you want to make... Uh, sure that a child sequences several steps in a row because that's our goal here is to explain uh, expand those play uh, options and so again a tractor or some other little uh, things for uh, other things to do that'll help make it easier to sequence steps there so add a tractor add like we said before a trough or something for putting water in you know that's real fun for kids to do to have a a little plastic animal, you know, you put real water in that little container and you're just going to hold that child's attention for much, much longer than had you not taken the time to plan something like that. All right, let's think about our language goals here. We're always going to think about what? Vocabulary development. <laughs> so a child needs a word for everything he or she would do while they are playing with this barn. So lots and lots of possibilities just for uh, semantic development here and expanding their vocabularies. Uh, let's think about utterance length. Are we going to phrases or are we going to longer phrases here? So that's certainly something we can think about with expansion and extension. And remember what we said those things were. Expansion is whatever the child says, he says a word or two, we're going to add another word, sometimes two, to that to make his, expand his utterance and make it longer. Extension is kind of the same thing. It's where we extend what a child is saying to make it more adult-like. So if he says tractor, you would and boy tractor, you would say, yes, the boy is driving the tractor. So that's an extension. It makes it longer. It gets his little childlike phrase extended to an adult-like model. So those are our big strategies there. Let's talk about our other goals that we can easily incorporate here with this kind of barn play. Uh, let's talk about receptive language. So what about following two-step commands? And so let me say, unless the child is consistently following what? One-step commands, he can't get to two-step commands. So if you're doing a ton of two-step commands, figure out what's wrong. Is it too long? Do you need to just still focus on those single step commands? Or maybe you need that in-between step that we said, like finding two different items. So maybe with him, the kind of play that you would do would be like, oh, I see some things right here. Give me the cow and the duck. 
you know, and he does that. Or, okay, now let's get the boy and the tractor. Okay, now find the mommy and the pumpkins. You know, that, again, is a way to really help him develop that working memory. And he's got to listen for those two parts and not leave off the first part and get the second or leave off the second and get the first. You know, he's got to combine those. So that's, that's a good way to kind of think about that progression. If I have a child that can't do two-step commands yet, what can he do? What's the problem here? Is it the individual vocabulary? Does he need more verbs? Do we just need to spend some time on receptive language with, with verbs? Do we need to really have him, you know, see him demonstrate the cow can walk, the cow can climb, the cow can fly, the cow can drink, the cow can eat, the cow can sleep, the cow can jump. And so again, look at what where your holes are, you know, and try to figure out and be a detective here. And therapists are great at that, but sometimes parents aren't so great. You know, they just think, oh, it's, you know, they think it's one problem and it's really something else so that's where we come in as therapists with really presenting these possibilities you know is it that the command is too long is it that they don't understand the verbs is it you know what what is it figure out what that deficit is and really fill in that gap because that's where we can be uh, you know again more help to a parent than anything else is helping them really think about and and pinpoint exactly what's wrong and then help give them really specific strategies and activities to work through that and help that child accomplish uh, those goals. All right, let's talk about our bigger goals here. We said for a child who was at that 24 to 30 month developmental level, we said ING verbs. And again, you can target this just in so many natural contexts here with your different animals doing different actions and you can model 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 which again what do we say when we've talked about uh high intensity modeling what does research tell us it says that kids need to hear a target word how many times a minute nine times a minute that is so much repetition but that's what so many of our little friends need and that's what research tells us that when they hear that word that many times they're going to retain that word and then be able to say that word so that's a big big uh, important strategy and important lesson for us to remember here is just how important repetition is all right plurals we can work on that naturally here more than one duck duck becomes ducks the pig become pigs and so you can do some nice little things with grouping <coughs> you can also work on that grouping goal where maybe you're even, you know, you can actually group all the cows, all the ducks, all the pigs. But you can do some things with grouping vehicles versus people or animals versus, you know, trucks or anything that you would do. So farm play is fantastic for toddlers. It's a great way to keep them motivated. And again, you can work on just about any goal. Now, I love the next evolution of play here with vehicles, and that's with adding a place for all of those cars and trucks and trains and boats to go to. And so you can do something like a little garage or even like this little racetrack. Uh, and just, again, your purpose here is to help children sequence actions. So make sure there's something else for them to do. Even with a set like this for the primary, you know, focus here the purpose of the toy is helping uh, you know the, the cars go down the racetrack but there's a little a gas pump here we've got a little garage so kids can put cars in there and remember even something like sequencing four cars in a row you know first it's the orange cars turn and then it's the green cars turn and then the blue car even if they're just doing that just make sure again that our purpose here is expanding play so that they're just getting a couple of actions going in a row so these are two fantastic toys for you to use now don't get lost here what are your goals at stage six remember it's what you get more steps and more phrases so look for those combinations look for those actions um, so again that you're giving a child not only something to do but to talk about uh, while he's doing it one more classic toy that we haven't talked about in this whole podcast series is potato heads. And that's kind of a staple for speech therapy with toddlers and preschoolers. So let's talk about potato heads. And again, it's really appropriate for this stage of play because we have lots of pieces and lots of different things to talk about. Now you can certainly do requesting when you have just a an empty potato head and you're holding all the pieces and so you want a child to ask you for what comes next and that's fantastic and we can certainly do that 
with uh, requests, with phrases, with, you know, hat please, or more ears, or I need arm, you know, those kinds of things. And so work on that with putting the potato head together. But then some of our little friends, this is not going to be enough to hold their attention, or for whatever reason, they're just not interested in the potato heads yet. And so again, this might be a child who play is probably not at this developmental level. It's probably going to be a kid who's before here. And we talked about this back in show four. Uh, 70 the show right before this one but I wanted to mention it again when we have a child who seems interested or maybe not even interested but we we just can't get him to stay with a toy and sometimes it is because that toy is too hard and he doesn't really get that whole purpose of play with that toy and so we start with what we call deconstruction and that just means that we're going to take the toy apart and play with it that way instead of playing it uh, the right way or assembly or putting it together and so potato heads are a fantastic option for kids who are you know kind of in this stage where again we're teaching them how to play and so instead of putting these pieces on we're going to take the pieces off and again um, this might be too much for some children who are busy sensory seekers who just need to do two or three things or can only do two or three things before they are off to do their own thing and you've got to kind of pull them back to finish the activity your know, deconstruction is a great way to help those kids really learn how to focus and complete that entire task and so here their job is going to be to take the pieces off and so a lot of times with these kids too they're not really talking yet and so you're going to be doing the narrating and so again you know glasses off hat off and maybe even give the instructions where you're cueing and they're they're really having to learn how to listen and so you're saying to them shoes let's take the shoes off next get the shoes and you may even be again cueing that with visual cues with pointing or you know help those little auditory cues even with tapping that they can they can hear it and they can see you doing it you're kind of you know multimodal cueing there and so help them with that deconstruction and let me tell you what always happens after a kid has done deconstruction for a while do you know what he's going to do after that you get all the pieces off he's going to naturally start to want to put them back on and when that happens don't stop him don't say no that's the end of that let's no that's what we want and so after you've done deconstruction for a few sessions or days or weeks or however you think about it with kids he's going to naturally start oh getting that next piece back out and then you know what <laughs> he's ready he's ready to put it together because he's shown you that so deconstruction is a great way to get there when kids again aren't getting there on their own so a toy with a lot of pieces like this start with taking it apart rather than pulling it together or putting it together um, a container is going to make this a lot easier for kids because there's a visual ending and they've got something to do you can have kids just kind of discard the pieces on the floor but i found just helping them kind of see that it's all together and again that definite ending for the task it makes kids who have a hard time kind of sitting through a whole play routine with you they can see oh i've just got to get all the pieces in there and then i'm done and again they're not doing that verbally but you know by watching their behavior that's uh, what they're thinking and how they're processing it so deconstruction is a great toy for that and i love potato heads for this age you can do a ton of different things with that uh, a ton of different language goals i've got some cute videos about potato heads that i did a while back that uh, really walk through my levels of imitation and i'll try to link that below so if you haven't seen those videos take a look you're going to get a lot of good ideas for potato heads the last kind of play we want to talk about today would be sensory play opportunities. Now, I've said over and over that this work is an extension of Dr. Carol Lucky's work with symbolic play, but she identifies sensory play, particularly with sand, as one of the best or, or most popular focuses for children in this developmental period from 24 to 30 months. So let's talk about different sensory play opportunities. Now there's a formula for it, and once you learn the formula, again, you're going to be able to apply this and use it in lots of different settings with lots of different kids who have lots of different goals. And so I think about this for this formula. I think first I need a container. Now if you are playing one-on-one -on -one individually with a child, a small container like this is perfect. 
For groups of children, you need something bigger like a water table or a sensory table that you can switch out the different fillers, which we're going to talk about next. And I'll try to link the sensory table that uh, I used in my office for a long time. I'll link that uh, here below. But otherwise, just for moms at home with your own light talker that you're working with, these little plastic containers that you can get, you know, for less than 10 bucks at Walmart uh, with a top are kind of the way to go. So the first thing you want to do is get a container. Next, you want to think about what your filler is. Now Dr. Westby really uh, talked about sand and so here in Florida sand is plentiful for me <laughs> but if you uh, are looking to get sand for your uh, play sensory play boxes uh, I've linked some clean sand here below but you can also get that at Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere like that but sand has gotten pricey so I use the free version here. You can also use uh, like gift bag filler which you can get at uh, dollar stores and I like that a lot. You you can also use rice or beans or pasta. Uh, let's talk about the obvious when we're choosing filler. We really don't want to use it with kids who are still mouthing lots of materials. And that's just from a practical standpoint. And my little rule is if I'm spending more time managing behavior than teaching language or play, that's not the, the activity that I want to use with a child. Because then that becomes all about saying no or all about limiting what they're naturally wanting to explore. And I just don't feel like you can get much else done <laughs> when you're focused on that. So wait until until the child developmentally is not mouthing so many things and coincidentally that happens at 24 months where children aren't really uh, as mouthy or as oral as they were previously so get yourself a container decide on your filler and then add some tools now what do i mean by tools that would be something for a kid to use to manipulate the filler so if you have sand certainly something like uh, my little set here with shovels and rakes and scoops are perfect if you don't have that go raid the kitchen and just get some spoons and some measuring cups and some scoops from uh, your supplement containers or you know whatever you have available there and this is so fun for kids and this will literally keep them busy for hours if you are a parent at home now this really isn't language wise you know anytime a child is independently playing they're not really learning language right but they are learning play skills and that's fantastic but again you want to have have some opportunities uh, where you might give them different different things to do when they are independently playing with their sensory boxes versus the kinds of things you're doing when you're playing with them and so think about that too now beyond your container your filler and your tools most kids are also going to need something to do now with the sand that can be putting it in a bucket or again, your uh, measuring cup or some other, you know, a cool whip container, anything uh, that would give them something to do with that sand. The other thing that's so fun that lots of speech therapists do is really hide little objects in the material. And I tell you, a lot of times I'll just introduce the container and the filler and the tools for a week or two and then put the objects in as a surprise a week or two later. And that's a way to extend a kid's attention. And then it's like, oh, it's become new again. So it's a great way to kind of, uh, you know, elongate that process. Now, older childers might expect there to be something in there from the beginning. <laughs> so you'll just have to see see what you do. But it, hide objects in your filler. In this one, I have lots of sea creatures. Uh, I think I played with this last with my two-year-old grandbaby Henry, and that's what he was really into when he came to see us. So you can certainly do that or anything, uh, any other little animal packs. And you can pick these up for cheap, like at the cash register at Walmart. So uh, you, you can even do, if you're working with older children on articulation and you're using, you know, something like pictures rather than uh, real toys, you can still hide these pictures in there and that's going to make that routine a lot more fun and hold that child's attention a lot better than if you had just done even a naming activity with flashcards. And this is a less, maybe less efficient way to do it, but it's a whole lot more fun and a whole lot uh, more developmentally appropriate. And you can certainly work on your older uh, goals that we've been talking about. And let's review them one more time here at the end. Remember, our big language goals were what? We want longer phrases to get to three or more words by the end of this period. We want to use a lot more action words, so a lot more verbs. So you can certainly do that with your objects once a child has found the animal. 
those aren't good examples. Here's a turtle. You know, you can make that turtle do all kinds of things, you know, and, and really uh, see if you can get that child to say 10 different verbs, you know, what, whatever your little number is or what, how many, you know, five new verbs that he might use during that activity. So really get creative with that. So your verbs. And then what else did we say? We said we were going to use verb tenses like with ing verbs. So we can certainly think about that. We said we were going to do plurals. And so we have to have uh, rates and spoons and something else again to make plural so we can target that we can do our possessives with uh, Laura's uh, lion versus Logan's lion as we're playing we can do um, our pronouns there and really work on our pronouns so anything you can adapt uh, those goals with your activities uh, if you're just a little bit creative and I hope that I've given you tons of ideas through this whole show to do that all right so we are at the end of our toy review I'm going to show you a couple of more resources that I have for you at Teach Me to Talk that may be really really helpful to you as you are working with children in this developmental level. I've already mentioned the Late Talker Workbook, which has three different plans, all evidence-based for teaching a late talker, and that would be a child who's two or older, who's not using at least 50 words, or who, again, for whatever developmental level that they're at, there's a delay between what they're doing versus what the expectation is. So super, super book to get you started. It's written for both parents and professionals. There's a sit down and do therapy plan in here that works fantastic for therapists who are doing direct sessions as well as parent training programs if you are a therapist working with parents and you want to give them strategies and activities to use at home great great book to do it this is also a fantastic book that parents are telling me is guiding them for their home programs so i'm so excited to share it with you so that's the late talker workbook if you're working with a child with autism <coughs> please check out the autism workbook there are 12 different focuses or goals or big areas of development that we look at with a child's language, a child who's already been diagnosed with autism or a child who has markers for autism. Uh, let's talk about talking is a fabulous goal uh, or a fabulous resource for working toward your goal of getting a, a child to be verbal. And so here we're looking at the pre-linguistic skills that all children master uh, before they begin to use words. And so this is a fantastic a book for parents and therapists, particularly when you have a child who's just really stumping you, that you're not understanding really what's going on, that you're not sure why they're making a, not making a lot of progress. So the checklist and the questions, and let's talk about talking, will walk you through that process. And finally, teach me to play with you. And there's some information in here about playing with the kinds of toys that we've talked about through this series, especially the earlier toys that are familiar to all kids. Blocks, balloons, uh, bubbles, those kinds of early toys, but also this book just focuses on that social engagement piece. So teaching a child how to perform little games and routines and finger plays and songs with you, learn how to do those motions, and then finally start to talk in the context of those games. So I hope that you'll check these resources out and they are all linked right here below in the post on YouTube. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for hanging in here with me through this entire long course. I so appreciate it. If you're a therapist, don't forget to go get your CE credit at teachmetotalk.com. And uh, this show is number 471. That's it for today. I'll see you next time for show 472. Thanks so much.